going to, Lord willing, be finishing chapter 3 this morning. As you can tell by the title, uh, Waiting on God. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many people have had to wait on God. It seems like as I read throughout the Bible, uh, God usually doesn't act uh, right away in many situations. Uh, occasionally, maybe He does, but most of the time he, he waits for us to learn something or go through something to help us, and then eventually He comes in just at the nick of time. Now, if anybody doesn't like waiting, it, it's me. And I, I'm just going to confess to you this morning I have a problem with waiting. And uh, I'm trying to work on that. Uh, Shelly says that uh, some of the things that I do, I want instant gratification. Can you believe that? Me? Instant gratification. Well, I came across something to hopefully try to make sense of this whole concept of waiting. And this is really cool. So I thought I'd share this with you this morning. It's called The Culture of Impatience and Instant Gratification. This is a guy that wrote this, and this is what he says. He says, sometimes I yell at my phone when the screen freezes. Just last week, I felt my heart beat rapidly, increasing and my legs shaking when the customer service representative from Amazon put me on hold for a few minutes because my package didn't arrive in two days. It turned out that my package got lost somewhere between UPS and my apartment, so I had to wait a whole extra two days to receive my order. Waiting four days for a delivery seems like an eternity in today's society. In fact, we've even termed a coin for that which gets mailed normally. We call it snail mail, which, by the way, the post office doesn't greatly appreciate. Instant gratification is the need to experience fulfillment without any sort of delay or wait. This applies to the whole host of things, including online pornography, gambling, drug and alcohol use. When it comes to gambling in particular, there's a plethora of new online casinos on the market which are luring an ever-growing amount of players by promising great fun and easy wins. Just last night we were uh, going to bed and we had the television on and all of a sudden there's this new app that you can get for casinos. I mean, this is incredible. Ultimately, you want it now, and waiting can be very hard, and when people don't get what they want, the psychological reaction is anxiety. Often I used to think that anxiety was just caused by, you know, not knowing exactly what was going to happen or maybe fretting about something that it could possibly happen. But really, in counseling, they have found out that the majority of anxiety that people face is because they have to wait. Isn't that interesting? To capitalize on that desire, companies are taking consumer anxiety and sprinting with it, absolutely offering same-day delivery services, eliminating the need to wait for a taxi, providing the ability to stream full seasons of TV shows within seconds. No more going. Remember when you used to have to go to the video store? <laughs> now it's like instantaneous. If you think about it, anything can be delivered, food, flowers, furniture, clean laundry, instant answers on Google, groceries, and even people. I mean, we're to the point now where we got our little Google things and we say, hey, Google, what's this? What's that? Instant answers at your fingertip. They may not always be accurate. Not literally here, but with the apps like Tinder, Grindr, JSwipe, there are 50 million romantic candidates right at people's fingertips waiting for you to filter them by location and so on. Retailers, too, are reaping the benefits of society's growing impatience. Walmart and eBay have challenged Amazon in a battle of which company can deliver the fastest because consumer habits have made it clear that they will pay big bucks to avoid the wait. Leading places like Disney World to profit off from passes that allow customers to skip the line. Aha! Instant gratification has even made its way into your living room. DVRs have eliminated the need to watch commercials or wait for TV times. Some companies such as ABC and NBC have resorted to forcing their viewers to watch their advertisements by adding features that prevent them from fast-forwarding. In the same vein, internet providers are delivering faster connections for a higher cost and are tempting buyers with their advertising 
speeds. I mean, think of it. I mean, I talk about griping because my internet is slow. And years ago, we didn't even have such a thing as internet. We had to do things the old-fashioned way. You go to a library or you look up something. I mean, everything now is totally different. It's instant. Finally, this article says, the patience of internet users is notoriously slow, and even minuscule differences in buffer times can have massive impact on the success of a business. University of Massachusetts uh, professor Ramish Stearman conducted a study to establish the point at which people begin to leave a YouTube video that loads slowly. That interesting. So this is big now in the advertising world. How fast can we get it? How quick can the response time be? And people make big business. I mean, I got to be honest with you. If I'm ordering a product from Amazon, I'm what's called a Prime member, which means that you get supposedly two-day service on all products, right? But the only way to get the two-day service is if that particular product that you're buying is actually under the heading of two-day shipping. So it's not guaranteed. And sometimes we will pay, what, 20, 25 to 30 bucks just to get something sent second day air. And if you're really impatient, you can do next day air. When I was still in the shipping business, when I was working at the denominational office, UPS has what's called Sonic Air. And it's over $200 to ship Sonic Air, but it gets there the same day. Can you believe it? This is what's going on with the whole concept of waiting. And so far in the book of Ruth, we have observed people waiting all throughout the story. In fact, if you remember, as you look back at the chapters, it starts with impatience of a family who wouldn't wait for God. They experienced a famine. And as a result of the famine, what happened was is that they fled the place where God had provided, and they moved to a place that was corrupt called Moab because of instant gratification. Elimelech, in impatience, left the place of blessing. Naomi and Elimelech were impatient and found Moabite women for their sons. Naomi watched as Elimelech grew sick and he eventually died. Naomi watched and waited as Malon and Killian died, her sons. And then we learned that Naomi waited 10 years while everything was upside down in her life. And finally, the Word of God came and told her the waiting was over. God had once again restored grain in Bethlehem. So they left to the place called the House of Bread. That's what Bethlehem means. And so Naomi and Ruth have now trusted God to provide. During this time of molding and shaping, they have come to the understanding that God is sovereign. That God will meet their need. That God will be there to provide whatever it is that they need. And so we find ourselves, as we've been going through this romantic story of a guy by the name of Boaz. Naomi was creative, as a mother-in-law sometimes is, and she began to put together her plot, which unfolded. And if we remember that Ruth went out to glean... She met Boaz, and he wasn't just any other man. He was, a, he was a family member, and we learned the term. He was a, a what? A kinsman, right? A kinsman redeemer. And we spent a great deal of time last week looking at the practical and spiritual meaning of a kinsman redeemer uh, over the Jewish context. Let me just give you a quick review, if you can look behind me. Remember, there are two different types of redeemers that were within the Jewish culture. The first role that would happen is that this person would redeem a member of his family who had become a slave, and he could buy him out of his slavery. But the one that we have looked at was called Goed, and what that means is that he would marry a close relative whose husband had died, and delivering her from the poverty that she would be facing 
continuing the name of her dead husband. So in that culture, it was the brother-in-law's responsibility or the closest relative to marry the woman of the dead husband. So it would continue the family line. And of course, we remember that in Jewish culture, families was a big deal. And it's interesting, as I looked at this study, if you ever have a chance to look at that, that timeline map that Harry King had when he was going through uh, his evolution series, you have all of the details of the Jewish lineage, all of the family lines, all 12 tribes are still represented and still in place to this very day. It's incredible. They have uh, ways of recording these things that don't ever get lost. And so, Boaz is this Goel, and he is one that is going to be able to marry a close relative, and in this particular case, we have seen that he has fallen in love with this girl named Ruth. In fact, we saw last week that the meeting had gone well. Everything Ruth was told to do, she did. And she did something that was kind of bizarre in all culture. She went at night, and she laid at Boaz's feet. And then what happened was is that uh, she asked him to cover her with his robe. And that would signify, I'm available to be able to be redeemed by you. Now, by all the laws of the Old Testament, Boaz was on board to marry Ruth. But there was a problem, and that's where we ended last week. With every good love story you're going to hit a problem. There's something underneath the surface that's going to try to mess it all up. And so here's the problem. Boaz could not intervene because there was another relative that was closer to Ruth and Naomi. So this is a problem. And so when we come to the 12th verse, through the end of the chapter, this particular problem needs to be resolved. This other man... In the story, interestingly, is a man that is never given a name. Never throughout the entire story is he ever named. I tried to do as much research as I could to try to figure out who this guy was, and there's nothing out there. The scripture is absolutely silent about it. So let's take a look here. As we consider them waiting at this point, there's going to be some principles that are going to emerge from the story, and I don't want you to miss them. Let's look at the first principle. We're going to look at Boaz first, okay? So in your notes, you'll see Boaz. And here's the first thing we're going to see about waiting. Waiting to determine God's will. That's the first thing we're confronted with. Waiting to determine God's will. Verse 12. But while it's true, Boaz says to Ruth, that I am one of your family redeemers, there is another man who is more closely related to you than I am. Now, let's just play around with this a little bit. If you were Ruth, and you're feeling the protection, the affirmation that he just gave her about wanting to redeem her, what might first go through your mind as you think about the fact that he says, you know what, I'll gladly do it. Yes, but... There's somebody that's closer. What, what do you think if you're this girl? She's already given her heart to this guy. She already feels this emotional connection, and now he, he has to add this butt into it and say, there's another guy. She doesn't have any clue who this person is. She doesn't know if he's older than Boaz, who was already much older than she was. She doesn't know if he's a, well, it could be a younger guy. Because if she's closer in, if he's closer in, in the family line, he's probably even older. So imagine the thoughts that are going through it. Now, I, I, this is confession time this morning. You know another thing that happens to me if I, if I come into a situation like this? I'm going to try as much as I can to try to figure out a loophole. I'm going to try to find some way to make it work, even if I have to stretch something, do something. I mean, can't we just not tell the guy? I mean, don't say anything to him. You know, he, he doesn't care. It'll just look like a normal marriage. 
So even though there's the temptation to find this loophole, you're dealing with Boaz, who is a very honest guy. One of the things that I want you to see here in your notes, when you're waiting on God's will, a couple things here. You don't have to try and force the outcome if it's God's will. Listen to that carefully. You don't have to force anything if it's God's will. And then look at the next one. God will provide all that is necessary to make it happen. And this, folks, is a test of learning to trust in God's timing. God will put those kind of situations in your life so that you can learn to trust on Him, even though we are tempted to intervene when we want to try to make it happen. And so this is, this is a real problem. Waiting is a very human problem that we find often in the Word of God, including the book of Ruth. And as pressure seems to have taken over our culture, waiting seems to be the most frustrating experience. But, listen to this. In God's sovereignty, He chose to place a potential foil in this nearly perfect story. Our gracious and loving Lord does that sometimes. He desires our good and to grow in faith in Him. He allows difficulties, tensions, trials to come into our lives so that we will learn to trust Him. And in Ruth's case here, there was the problem of a closer relative. And this is a test. This is a test. Let's take a look as it begins to unfold here. Boaz, despite his potential problem, assures Ruth, look at in verse 13, that he would see to her redemption. Look at what he says here. Stay here tonight and in the morning, I'll talk to him. And if he's willing to redeem you very well, let him marry you. But if he is not willing, then as surely as the Lord lives, I will redeem you myself. Now lie down here until morning. Now, again, if you're a romantic like I am and you read these verses, this is not what I want to have as a choice. I want you to say to me, don't worry, Ruth, I'll make sure that I will be your redeemer, that I will be the one to marry you. It'll be like you have wanted it to be. But there has to be this, this kind of tension there. It is built into the storyline on purpose. And so, Boaz, Ruth, Naomi are all going to be in a pattern of waiting. But Boaz still assures her, no matter what's going to happen, you're going to be taken care of. So while Boaz is waiting, he does three things. Let's take a look at him. Number one, while waiting, Boaz proposes to Ruth. That's what's in the text there. He says, stay here tonight. And I am willing, look at that's the word there. The Hebrew word means I have accepted the responsibility. I am willing to redeem you very well. That is what I want. That is what I desire. But then he says, stay here tonight. By the way, this is interesting. I, I looked at this phrase, stay here tonight. Up until this time, uh, marriage has only been considered by Naomi and Ruth, and now, all of a sudden, Boaz is taking the initiative here. He's accepting her gesture by asking her to stay with him. There's nothing improper about this. He's simply saying that, I am providing you the opportunity, and I've accepted the responsibility of marrying you. Interestingly, it's the first time that Ruth has never slept at home. Remember what she said to Naomi, wherever you live, I will live. Wherever you go, I will go. And now for the first time here, she's not with Naomi. Boaz knows about another kinsman, but he doesn't want him to know about Ruth until he tells him. So he's keeping her close to him. Boaz doesn't want to give this kinsman any advance notice. Why? Why do you think that is? Why, why is he not telling him sooner? Why is he not allowing Ruth just to go home that night? Because, folks, he's in love with Ruth. Boaz is in love. And he's trying to protect her. So you've got two things going on. You've got Boaz who wants to marry her, 
and keep her close to him. You've got, you've got Ruth who wants to marry Boaz, but now there's this other guy. Again, our culture, we simply choose our mates. But in this culture, there's an order to it. So Boaz is waiting, but while he's waiting, he's assuring Ruth that if this doesn't work out, he wants Ruth to know he'll be here for her. He will be the shelter of refuge for her. I love that. Shelter of refuge. Again, remember I I said last week that the book of Ruth is penned by the power of the Holy Spirit who is teaching us about God. He's teaching us about the Redeemer. Look behind me at this psalm. This This is so incredible. Those who live in the shelter of the Most High, in our relationship with God, will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. He will cover you with His feathers. He will shelter you with His wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Look at the imagery there. And then he goes on to say, The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me and I will protect those who trust in my name. Folks, those are promises for God's children. Those aren't might be's. They aren't even necessarily just for Israel. Because once we become a child of God, we claim the wonderful promises of His children. So this is incredible. So while he's waiting, he proposes to Ruth. But also notice number two in your notes. While waiting, Boaz protected Ruth. Look at verse 14. So Ruth lay at Boaz's feet until the morning. Now look at carefully. But she got up before it was light enough for people to recognize each other. For Boaz had said, no one must know that a woman was here at the threshing floor. Why? What is transpiring here? First and foremost, he wants to protect her safety. He doesn't want her to travel back in the middle of the night. He doesn't want her to take the roads, the dark roads that lead back to where she lives. She could get mugged, she could get raped, all kinds of horrible things could happen. So he's protecting her, stay here. But more than that, he wants to protect her reputation. He wants to protect her reputation. No one was to be told. Listen, young people, when you're dating and you have a young guy, there should be nothing more important for that young man than to protect your reputation. You do not want to be put in a compromising situation where people have to wonder. If a guy really loves you, he will protect your reputation. He's going to watch over you. He's going to protect you. He's going to care about how you are perceived by the outside world because nothing to a young girl is more important than her reputation. And so he's protecting her. Look behind me, Psalm 121. The Lord keeps you from all harm and watches over your life. The Lord keeps watch over you as you come and go, both now and forever. That's a verse to memorize right there. Always will be there to protect us. So notice number three, while he's waiting, Boaz provided for Ruth. Look at verse 15. Then Boaz said to her, bring your cloak and spread it out. And he measured six scoops of barley into the cloak and placed it on her back. Then he returned to town. There is no doubt that this man is taken with this woman. And when you start sending presents now, he he goes on to say, look at verse 16, when Ruth went back, to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked what had happened. And Ruth had told Naomi everything Boaz had done and said, don't go back, look at verse 17, to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Look at who he's thinking about. This is incredible. Somebody once said, when you start sending presents to your mother-in-law, you know you're in love. 
Often while we wait, we can feel paralyzed. We, we might feel that there's nothing that we can do. But notice this in your notes. Being gripped by concern, Boaz is a wonderful illustration of what it's like to be busy while he's waiting. There's something that he is doing. By the way, um, I'm going to show you an Old Testament passage here. You remember King Saul? And uh, God had anointed him as the king of Israel. And after he was to go through all of the different things, one of the things that he would do is that he would keep busy and find work to do as he waits to take the kingdom. And look at this verse. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, talking about Saul, and you will, be, you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. That happens, by the way, when a person becomes saved today. A man or a woman. They are changed. Now, when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Stay busy. Stay focused on what God has provided for you to do. In this room, all of us have something that we are to do while we're waiting for Christ's return. We're busy at work in our businesses. We're working for the glory of God. We're taking care of kids. We're raising them, we're, we're mentoring them, all of this stuff we are doing, and we are to be about working until God comes back. And that's exactly what Boaz does. He's waiting, but yet while he's waiting, it's not static. He's not just saying nothing and doing nothing. By the way, that was the problem, if you remember, with the church uh, when uh, Paul had to write to them and say, you know... My re the Lord's return could come at any time, but that doesn't mean to stop working. You have to stay busy doing about all of the things that God wants you to do. And so God's going to provide for us until He comes back. Do you realize that? God is going to provide for you until He comes back. That's what all of the Scriptures say. Commentator makes these makes a statement here. He gave her a large amount of grain. Remember now that the harvest is over. The winnowing of the grain is the end of it. So he sends food home to Naomi to show what Ruth had done to honor her and to honor Naomi. Sometimes, he goes on to say, God calls us to wait for certain things. We are not normally called to wait for everything. So while we're waiting on one thing, God can energize us in some other area. Maybe you are waiting right now. If so, note that while Boaz waited, he worked. There were things he did while he waited for this matter to be settled. He was busy. He was going about doing the work that God had given him to do. That brings us to number two. We've looked at Boaz. Now let's look at Naomi. Naomi. Naomi was waiting to discover God's will. While Boaz was waiting to determine God's will, Naomi was waiting to discover it. And perhaps uh, Naomi has put this whole thing together. She understands it. This plan was hatched in her creative mind. But yet she still has to wait. Look at verse 16. When Ruth went back to her mother-in-law... Naomi asked, what happened, my daughter? By the way, let me stop there. Let's bring this into a 21st century context. If you were out all night, and it was a daughter, and came home, would you say, hey, daughter? Hey, Ruth, what, what, what was up with you last night? What do you think would come into our mind? Exactly, the same thing that comes into my mind. Again, the problem is, is we're, we're looking at that in a... 20th, 1st century context. We're looking at it like, sure, you didn't do anything and you were behaving yourself while you were out all night. But again, this was a cultural issue and Naomi knows exactly what was happening. She wants to hear all of the details of the story. What was going on? So Ruth told Naomi everything Boaz had done for her. So that means that she told her mother-in-law about the fact that there's this other guy in the picture. So Ruth 
explained everything, and verse 17 says, she added, he gave me these six scoops of barley and said, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. And of course, Naomi knows exactly what that means. She's been waiting patiently to find out how things went, but she knows Boaz, she understands the reasons for the delay, and now with the kind gesture of Boaz's grain, take a look at your notes here. What has happened is is that he is acknowledging Naomi here. Boaz is acknowledging Naomi. He did not want Ruth coming back empty-handed. Think of that word, empty-handed. What does that remind you of when Naomi had left Moab to come back to Bethlehem? What did she say? The Lord sent me away full but I have returned what? Empty. And so this is God's way of painting the picture to say, now Naomi, you are no longer going to be empty. You're going to be provided for. You're going to be taken care of. Everything is going to work out. Not only is it going to work out for Ruth, but you, Naomi, are also going to be taken care of. It's just beautiful. You see God's protection, the interweaving of all of the details of the story. It's incredible. He wants Naomi to know that he understands her suffering, just like God understands our suffering and our waiting. So take a look at it in your notes. Naomi had suffered two tragic kinds of emptiness in her life. The first one, obviously, was famine and childlessness. Imagine that as a mom, losing all your kids and your husband. I mean, you can see where she would come back feeling empty. One commentator I read speaks of the symbolism that may have been at play with the gift of the barley grain. I thought this was so cool because when we think about the two kinds of emptiness, listen to what he says. As a supplement to the generous provision, the gift of grain assured Naomi of Boaz's commitment that fullness would indeed banish famine. As for the second emptiness, many scholars view the gift merely as a symbol of Boaz's determination to arrange Ruth's marriage. But really, the idea was symbolic of what the barley represented, the seed. Listen to this. Seed is a suitable symbol of offspring. The grain meant represented a down payment on a final ending of the second emptiness. The seed to fill the stomach was promised to fill also the womb. Thus the grain assured Naomi that Ruth would soon marry an answer to her long-forgotten prayer. That in turn would make the birth of an heir possible. In some, empty-handed hinted that the denouncement of the second theme, childlessness, might lie just around the corner, unquote. Just around the corner. Boaz gives the grain to speak of the symbolism filling her hunger and filling the family line. It's a beautiful representation of the way that God works. So the seed is illustrated to fill the stomach, filling the prayer of Naomi. But now Naomi and Ruth have to wait. And that brings us to our last verse in the story, number three in your notes, Ruth. And that is waiting to do God's will. Waiting to do God's will. So while Boaz is waiting to determine it, Naomi's waiting to discover it, Ruth had to wait until she could do the will of God. Verse 18, look at it. Then Naomi said to her, Just be patient, my daughter, until we hear what happens. And I love this last part. The man won't rest until he has settled things today. You can just see it, can't you? There is no way this is going to be settled. I want it done now. And Boaz is going to make sure he finds out who this guy is. And that's the next week when we find out what's going to happen when he meets this guy. 
And you're thinking, if you already don't know the rest of the story, you're thinking, oh man, the guy will just say, nah, that's okay, you just redeem her. But that's not what happens. No, it's a terrible thing. He says, yeah, I'll redeem her. And you're thinking, oh no, done, story finished. I'm crumbled. I'm back to being empty. And you're thinking it's all over with. But remember, folks, God works at the last minute. And what we're going to see is he's going to work through the other man's greed. God always takes the situation and he sees the heart of all of the people playing the part of the play. And he knows how they're going to act and react. And so within the provision of God, he uses all kinds of people's emotions and feelings and bents. And he's going to use them to weave a beautiful tapestry. And that, folks, is what's happening in our world today. We look at it as God's forgotten about us. We might look at it as, well, God owes an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah because of the stuff that's going on today. No. God is working incredibly in the details that we have no clue about. And boy, will we be amazed when it all fleshes out. I knew he was faithful. I knew he had a, a solution to the problem. Naomi's response in verse 18, look at your notes, indicates that Naomi has, the first one, faith in the process of God's sovereignty. That's something that we all need to learn, folks. Faith in the process of God's sovereignty. That is to wait to see how the matter will turn out, like the text says. And as a result of that, look at the second bullet there. She instructs Ruth to be patient. Look at that word. To be patient. So I did all kinds of word studies on that Hebrew word to be patient. It's a verb, and it's a very powerful verb. You can see it behind me. It's translated to wait. It is the word yashab. And it literally means to sit down. It means to rest in quietness. It means, in our vernacular, sit tight. Sit tight. I have got this figured out. Within the context here, it's the opposite of what she said in the beginning in chapter 3, verses 3 through 4, all the preparations that Ruth needed to do to meet Boaz. They had to do all of this stuff, all of this preparation. Now it's time to do no more prep, to sit and wait for God to do His stuff. We go about our business, we do whatever our hand finds to do, and we wait we are patient so if you if you put this all together look at your notes this is how it's wrapped up now that ruth has done her part she may sit down and wait to see how the whole thing is going to transpire and this is the same attitude that we are to have when we bring our request before god we are to wait the expression the man won't rest literally means in the construction of the Hebrew how the matter will fall. And I love the imagery. God's got all the pieces of the puzzle and he takes them, they're all a mess, they're all jumbled and all the pieces delicately fit right hand in hand with everything so that the end, after everything is panned out, it's a beautiful picture. God's sovereignty is all brought together. Look at your notes again, these two bullets. This means the confidence in the hidden hand of God. Look at that. The hidden hand of God is moving through your life and my life this morning. The hidden hand of God. I'm glad it's not my hand. Because my hand isn't sure. Look at the next bullet. The hidden hand of God who will direct the situation to the proper conclusion. Isn't that great? The proper conclusion. We know what the proper conclusion is. And the good news is, is God's got a plan to bring about the proper conclusion. Naomi expresses to Ruth that 
she also has the confidence in Boaz. Ruth can sit back and relax because she knows that Boaz himself is not going to rest. God is working through Boaz, and he will complete the task. Don't you love that verse that says, He who began, what? A good work in you will be complete in it. He'll complete it. He who began the good work is faithful, and he will be the one to complete it. It's incredible. So, here's how the part of the application is to us. Look at your notes. Once we've done our part, and that's bringing the situation before God, it is now safely in the hand of Almighty God, and it's going to accomplish His will for us in the situation. Turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Romans. You know this verse, I'm sure, very well, but this is exactly what Paul is talking about here in the book of Romans, chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse number 23. We'll begin at verse 22. It says, For we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up into the present time. And we believers also groan. Have we all say amen to that? Even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, look at this, look at the language, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering, and we too, what? Wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as His adopted children, including the new bodies that He's promised us, We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't have yet, we must, here it is, wait patiently and confidently. Look at the next text. Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4. Such things were written in the Scriptures long ago to teach us, and the Scriptures give us hope and encouragement as we wait patiently for God's promises to be fulfilled. He goes on, verse 5, may God who gives us this patience. Look at, God's the one that does it. He gives us the, the patience and the encouragement. Help you to live in complete harmony with each other. It is fitting for followers of Christ Jesus. Then all of you can join together with one voice giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So guess what? While we wait, we come together, we sing, we praise, we worship God together until that incredible time, until the waiting is no longer there, it's gone and we are immediately with Christ forever. Incredible. So Boaz was waiting to determine the outcome, Naomi was waiting to discover it, now Ruth has to wait until she can do the will of God. And don't close your Bibles yet because we've got a couple more places and then we're through. And that ends us today with action verbs for the Christian. This now, folks, is going to take everything that we have just learned and we're going to appropriate it in our lives this Sunday as we begin a new week. There are two scriptures that will help you to remember the importance of waiting. The first one I want to give you in your notes is we are to stand still. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 14, second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, chapter 14. This is the incredible story 
of standing still for God's people. Exodus chapter 14, beginning with verse number 10. You remember the scene, the Israelites are leaving, and all of a sudden, Pharaoh goes back to having a hard heart, and he's going to pursue the Israelites. Verse 10, as Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up, and look at what happens, because this is what happens to us. They panicked. They panicked when they saw the Egyptians overtaking them. They cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, this is so typical, why did you bring us out here to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? Look at the, listen to the sarcasm and the nastiness of that. That's what happens when you panic, by the way. You say things you ought not to say. What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? Didn't we tell you that this would happen while we were still in Egypt? Kind of like a, the oh, pessimist. I told you this was going to happen. Let us be slaves to the Egyptian. It's better to be a slave in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. Look at that. A bunch of complaining. Verse 13, but Moses told the people, don't be afraid. Look at it. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. And then he gives them the promise. The Egyptians that you see today will never be seen again. For the Lord Himself will fight for you. And then He adds these three words, Just stay calm. Just stay calm. The enemy behind you, the Red Sea before you, stay calm. If God has to part the sea to bring you into safety, He will. So, our application is we have to stand still. By the way, there was never a time in history of Israel when they wanted to run more than they did at that very moment. But Moses said, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord. The word stand still is the word yasab, and it literally means to stand still and resolute, without wavering, determined. That's the word. Number two, Number two. not only are we to stand still, but we are to be still. Be still. Psalm 46, the book of Psalms, and Psalm number 46. One of the most encouraging psalms in all of the Bible as it deals with waiting. Psalm 46, beginning with verse number 7. Verse number 7. The New Living Translation translates it, the Lord of heaven's armies. It's the word hosts. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Look at verse 8. Come and see the glorious works of the Lord. See how He brings destruction upon the world. He causes wars to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow and snaps the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Look at it. Be still and know that I am God. And I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Folks, if the God of Israel is your fortress, what do we have to worry about? What do we have to fret? A world that seems to be collapsing around us? Big deal. God's got it. He's taken care of it. The part that we have to do is stand still and be still. Because what we have a tendency to do is to complain. We can write and post all kinds of things about how horrible everything is. And it is. But he's got it. Be still before Almighty God, and you will not have to worry. Look at this word. It's the word rafa. It literally means take your hands off. That's what it means. By the way, take your hands off the problem. Don't get involved in the problem. Don't complain about the problem. 
It's a very hard command for us. But it says, withdraw and draw your strength from God. Take your hands off from the problem and relax. That's what we're to do. Stand still and be still. And know that God has got you. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for your...